You've just landed Inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. All right, everybody. I'm really excited to talk to our guest today. He is an innovation guru, and I've been kind of stalking him for the last couple of years. So let me introduce you to Paul Sloan. He's an entertaining, thought-provoking, motivational speaker, and a recognized expert on innovation, lateral thinking, and leadership. He has 35,000 plus followers on Twitter and is the author of 25 books on lateral puzzles and creative leadership. And over 2 million copies of his books have been sold. So we're going to maybe talk about productivity and how to write 25 books too. He facilitates meetings, leads workshops, and gives after-dinner talks and keynote addresses. His talks offer a unique blend of puzzling challenges, humor, and hard-hitting business messages. And I have to tell you, because I've watched a bunch of his videos online, he definitely gets the audience to think in ways I think they, they didn't go in expecting. Paul took a took a first in engineering at Cambridge. At IBM, he was top of sales school. He became MD of the database leaders, Ashton Tate, VP International for MathSoft Inc. and CEO of Monactive LTD. His latest book is Think Like an Innovator, which is published by Pearson. Paul, so excited to have you on today. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Tamara. So let's start with a, a question that's because, you know, I think the words creativity and innovation are thrown around a lot, yet we all have different meanings for them and they tend to be, you know, people use them in conversation, they interchange them. So from your perspective, what is the difference between creativity and innovation? Yes, an important starting point, really, because the, the words are bandied around a lot. And my definitions are very simple. I say creativity is thinking of something new and innovation is the implementation of something new. So if we have some great ideas in our conversation today and we go to crazy places, that's creativity. But there'll be no innovation. If you did something differently tomorrow as a result or I did something completely different, that would be an innovation. Um, so typically innovation involves doing something, taking a risk, spending some money, implementing something. So I think you might have alluded to in the last part of that answer, do people get stuck after creativity? You know, moving from creativity to innovation doesn't always happen. That's right. So uh, the front end of innovation in, in organizations, in, in corporations, involves thinking of new routes to market, new ways to do things, new products, new services. And although they don't do enough of it, it's reasonably easy to do. It's reasonably easy to generate some great ideas. It's e fairly easy to evaluate and select the best ones. But then it becomes hard because you've got to actually prototype them. You've got to allocate resources. Somebody's got to do it. So why do you f think it's so hard for organizations to innovate? Well, there are a number of, of um, things. You know, Peter Drucker, the great management guru, said this. He said, uh, we feed yesterday and starve tomorrow. Oh. And in business, we tend to do that. The, the thing that's working, the thing that's paying the rent, the product or service that's out there is what gets attention. And everyone's busy trying to make it work better and fix it and improve it and look after customers and look after employees. And nobody's really thinking about what's going to replace it, what's coming down the track, what's what we're going to do next. So one of the biggest enemies of innovation is busyness. Mm. The fact that everyone's working flat out really hard on doing the day job. And that's important. But you can't get innovation without cutting some people some slack. So you've got to give people some time and space and money and resource to actually experiment. And that means wasting money on things that don't work. And some of the other people in the organization resent that. We're, you know, we're working hard, making the production of the current system work really well. And those guys over there are goofing around <laughs> on crazy experiments, which, which don't work. And yet that's what innovation involves. So busyness uh, is one of the enemies. Complacency is an enemy of innovation. And bureaucracy is an enemy of innovation. Just the whole approval process and getting things up and running. So this may be a big question, but so if complacency and busyness and bureaucracy are the enemy, and, and I, I hear you and I see it all the time with a lot of our you know, larger clients in particular, what's the first step for overcoming that? Because if I'm listening and I'm going, yeah, that, that's my organization, we're, you know, we're a big, we're a multi-million dollar, maybe billion dollar company, how do you start to, to chip away at that? That's a good question. And my answer is this, innovation starts with a vision. 
And the leader has to have a vision of where the organisation is going and what it's going to look like in two or three years' time. And he or she paints that vision and says to people, we're going to have to change to get there. And they have to create a sense of urgency and they have to say why we need to change. People say we're doing OK, we're making a profit, you know, the customers like our products. Why do we need to change? And, and I'm sure the people in Kodak said that. And I'm sure <laughs> the people in Blockbuster and other places said that. Um, and of course, the, the leader has to create a, a vision for change and say, we're here today. We've done really well. But I want us to be somewhere different tomorrow. And we're going to look like this. We're going to be in different markets with different services uh, and doing more with fewer resources. And the way we're going to get there is by innovating. And I need your help to innovate. And the leader has to throw down a challenge and say, uh, just doing the day job ain't enough. You know, we're on a burning platform. We've got to find a solution. We've got to find a, a better way to meet the needs of customers in the future. And you guys are the ones who, who I'm looking to to bring forward some of the great ideas and to try new things. Well, and I think that, you know, you kind of nailed it there with the in solving the problems of the future. And I'd love to get your perspective on this because, you know, you mentioned Blockbuster and, and Kodak and, you know, all these companies that, you know, just to age myself, I grew up like, of course, they're the big dogs and now they're not even here. So, and there's, you know, I think several other that we could probably put on that list, um, you know, and, so I spent years doing the thing I hate the most, which is focus groups. I really am not a fan of them for a whole nother podcast reason. But, you know, part of the thing I found in those is we were constantly trying to solve yesterday's problems. Yes. Yeah. And as, as opposed to really understanding where the, where the consumer or the customer, whichever you call it, is headed. We talk a little bit about that because, you know, yeah, you can solve yesterday's problem, but the challenge is, right, once you get to market – the customers moved on, their behaviors moved on, or somebody else has solved it for them in a better way. Yes. And um, I remember hearing a famous story that Microsoft did a survey of users of Word, and they said to them, what, what 10 features would you like most in the next release of Word? And most of the features that the users requested were already in the product, and oh. the user just didn't know it. Right. Um, so, so just just... Adding more features to, to yesterday's product is not the answer, but it's hard because customers don't know what they don't know. Customers are notoriously poor at indicating radical innovations. They're very, very good at indicating incremental innovations. And you should run focus groups. You should listen to them and you should take note of what they say. But uh, the, they will mislead you as well. They'll tell you what they want is more of the same. Um, and uh, Clayton Christensen in his great book, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, points this out. And when I read this sentence in the book, it was a revelation to me. He said, great companies fail because they make the mistake of listening to their customers. Mm. And uh, customers typically well say we want more of the same. Um, and uh, they don't ask for anything new. Yeah, it's hard for them to tell you. And they, they also, they don't lie, but they also give you their aspirational self. So if, particularly if you're in a health or a, you know, lifestyle brand and you're in there trying to get them to tell you what they really need, um, you know, everybody puts their best foot forward. But, but I want to go to kind of what you're saying about how do you innovate then? I think that leads to my next question and where you're really an expert is this lateral thinking. So what is lateral thinking and why do organizations need it? Well, lateral thinking is a phrase coined by Edward de Bono in contrast to conventional thinking or vertical thinking where we run along on rails. We go straight ahead. Uh, we, we go vertically and build block on block, as it were. And lateral means coming at it from the side. It means deliberately taking a different approach and forcing yourself to take a different approach and saying, asking the question, is there a better way to provide the added value that we add? And the answer is always yes. There's always a different way to do what you're doing in terms of delivering the benefit that, that you do in, in, in doing the job that your product or service does for the customer. Um, and lateral thinking means exploring entirely uh, different ways to do it. So will you walk us through an example of you know, where lateral thinking led to an innovation? So, well, there's lots and lots of examples, but, uh, you know, until the 1920s, all shops were like Victorian shops and you'd go in and you'd ask the assistant for some butter or some bacon or some milk and the assistant would serve you. And a man called Michael Cullen said, what would happen if we turned the shop around and we let the customers help themselves to the goods and then pay when they left? And I'll bet the retail experts of the day said that's a really stupid idea. Yeah. You know, customers want service. They don't want around the back of the store. They'll get confused. You have to put price on everything. He said, I'm going to try it. And he created the world's first supermarket, the King Cullen store in New Jersey. 
And you know, it's a little tiny idea, isn't it? Yeah. Turn the shop around, let the customer help themselves. And its impact was huge, absolutely massive, a, a completely different way. And, and we do it all the time now. Um, and it's an example of lateral thinking, taking an entirely different approach. A young man was stuck at a conference in Paris in 2009. He couldn't get a taxi. And there's a desperate shortage of taxis in Paris. Anyone that's been there knows. And most people will say, well, the answer is to catch the bus or to get the metro or to walk or to wait until there's a, a taxi comes along. But he said, no, is there a different way to do this? And he said, what if I could harness the capacity of all the people in Paris who'd be quite happy to give me a lift if, if I just paid them a little? And that man's name was Travis Kalanick, and he founded Uber. That's a great um, example. It, it's, just, it's just approaching the problem from a different direction. Yeah. So will you give us some tips or exercises on how to do that? Because, you know, I think lateral thinking is one of those things that I love it. It sounds great. And then I sit down at my desk and I go, okay, now what? <laughs> yes. Well, there's a number of things that I teach on my workshops. I run workshops with, with corporations on this and we have a lot of fun and we do some lateral thinking puzzles and I show them how their, their thinking is constrained. But the general principles are as follows. First of all, check your assumptions. Every assumption that you make about the business, about the client, about the environment needs to be challenged. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. And very often it's the assumptions that hold us back. And the, the, the people who've been in the business the longer, the most experienced, the most intelligent, the most senior people in the organization are the ones with the most assumptions. Because they assume this is the way to do things and they assume things can't be done differently. Uh, because they were tried before or, or whatever other. And it's the newcomer very often who challenges those assumptions. But you can actually list assumptions that apply in the business and then just say, what if we broke these? What if we broke every rule that we conform to? And the hardest rules to see are the ones that you don't realize you're following every day. <laughs> right, exactly. Those are the assumptions the that we make. Ones. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in the software business with um, Ashton Tate, I remember going back a while, the one of the unwritten rules was that you, you protected the source code with your life. It was just your, your crown jewels. Your your most valuable secret was the source code to your your, your product, in our case, DBase. And in the case of Microsoft, it would be Word or Excel. They never let anybody see the source code. And then a man called um, Linus Torvalds came along and he said, what would happen if we broke rule number one and we let anybody see the source code of a product and change it? And he created... Linux, the open source software operating system. Which changed everything. Um, which changed everything. Yeah. And, of course, you lose control when you do that, but you also release a horde of innovation and creativity amongst uh, well-wishers and enthusiasts all around the world. And lots of other people have gone open source since. So it, it just was an entirely different approach. Instead of keeping your source code secret, you do the exact opposite. You make it open to anybody. You know, there's a there's a, an urban winery here in Denver where I am in Colorado, and I talk about them a lot when I keynote. Um, they're called Infinite Monkey, and they did exactly that. It was why I really admire Ben Parsons, who's the founder. When I when I interviewed him, we were talking. He said, you know, wine always – everybody assumes you have to have this, you know – Rolling Hills, Crescent Moon, like that's the name of wines or someone's, you know, hoity-toity name. And it has to be out in the vineyards and people have to, you know, drive out to you for a tasting. And he asked exactly, he did exactly what you were saying. And he challenged every assumption. He said, wait a minute, what if wine's made in the city? And what if people, like I was here where the people were to come for a tasting in our lounge. And what if, and this is where it became really breakthrough in the wine industry, what if what we put wine in cans, so single serve, like a beer? Yes. And it changed everything in the industry. But when he first did it, everybody thought he was, he was crazy. But to your point, it's the implicit assumptions that, that that's how it's done in that industry. And the first person to break it looks so crazy until it works. <laughs> That's right. So let's talk a little bit about emotion. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to back up for a second. I want to ask you to share a different story, if that's okay with you. Um, one of my favorite ones that I've heard you share, I believe it was a TED Talk. Uh, it's about penicillin. And I will leave it at that and let you fill in the gaps. But to me, that was a brilliant example of, of lateral thinking in a way that we don't do often. Yeah, it's the story of a young Scottish bacteriologist who went on holiday, I went on vacation. And when he came back, he found that one of the Petri dishes – that he hadn't cleaned and, uh, and he'd left in his laboratory had grown a mold. And um, it, it, most people would be, be upset. They'd say, oh, what a pain. I should have cleaned this out or the cleaners didn't do a good job or whatever. But he was interested because he saw that this mold was resistant to bacteria. 
and he'd stumbled upon penicillin. Um, and it wasn't just the fact that it was an accident. It was the fact that he was prepared for that accident and he was receptive to the the strange occurrence which happened. And great innovators are always curious. When something unexpected happens, they don't get upset. They don't get angry. They get curious. They say, why did this happen? Why did the customers react this way? Why did this mold reject bacteria? And by doing that, he was able to develop penicillin. Eventually, it was mass produced and it saved millions of lives, all based on an accident, a, a, a Petri dish that grew a mold. Um, but the lesson is the unexpected is something we should welcome and, and we should um, examine and we should be endlessly curious. You know, for those of you listening out there, I just want to pause and say what Paul just said is so important, this this idea of just staying curious. And, you know, we, we focus so much on failure versus success, but if we just focus on it as an outcome and why did we get that outcome, it is amazing the innovation that can come out of it. I want to shift a little bit to emotion because you, you talked about this and I believe it was a TED Talk and it's something I believe very strongly in as well. We talk a little bit about why getting emotional actually helps you innovate. And the reason I'm asking is I find this struggle oftentimes um, with people, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, where it's like we go to work and we leave all of our personal, any emotional thoughts at the door because we're supposed to not bring that to work. Yet, I think what I heard you say and what I believe is, you know, emotion can actually help. Yes, indeed. And um, I wrote a blog on this recently, and it was uh, why you should replace logic with emotion. Um, and uh, what I argue is that we're trained to be numerical. We're trained to be analytical. And when you go to business school, if you study for an MBA, you do case studies with spreadsheets. And it's all about numbers and return on investment and analysis and data. And in business, we analyze data. We look at the, the, the sales rates and the market share and, and all the data, all the figures. And this is useful. But you must never forget that people, whether they're customers or employees, are human beings. And, and human beings are motivated by feelings and emotions. And if you try as a, a, a brainstorm exercise, taking some good questions like uh, how can we increase sales by 20 percent and turning them around from being numerical into being emotional and say, how can we surprise and delight customers? How can we make customers smile when they hear our name? How can we make customers uh, really love and appreciate our product and talk about it, then you change the focus of the discussion and you're likely to get different answers and different ideas. And it's a lateral thinking technique which says replace the analytical with the emotional and you're approaching the problem from a different direction. So instead of saying how can we uh, reduce the rate of attrition amongst our technical staff, uh, you say how can we make everybody proud to work here? And it's a different kind of question and it'll get different kind of answers. Um, and we tend to, to shun emotions. Men in particular think it's kind of weak or effeminate to talk about feelings. But feelings are really important. And the things that make you feel proud or happy or, or fulfilled at work are really important. The things that make you feel frustrated and angry and depressed are really important too. You know, it's so interesting what you're talking about because, you know, I, I believe that one of the biggest challenges to success uh, isn't the marketplace and competition and all that. Yeah, that's all true. But really, at the end of the day, it's indifference. And in, I find that people make decisions that lead to indifference from their marketplace because they don't add emotion. It becomes a very logical, standard result. Um, yes, yeah, so because indifference is a killer, right? You don't love me or you hate me. I mean, I'd, I want one or the other from you. I want you to at least think about me in some way. Um, that's really the goal. Now, hopefully you love me enough to buy me. But to your point, anger and all that are just as strong too. Do you have a favorite example of when a, maybe it's a client of yours or just an example in the marketplace when they brought that emotion in, in maybe an industry where you would normally go, that's a very logical place? Yeah, there's lots of examples. And um uh, and, and and you're right, too, that when you launch a product, you want a reaction. You want yeah. either people to love it or to hate it. Uh, you don't want people to just say it's another Me Too product. Exactly. So the, the, the TV series South Park, when they trialed that, uh, the, the initial trial, and, and they put it out to the focus groups, a lot of people really didn't like it, especially women. Women found it quite offensive and juvenile, uh, puerile in its approach. But a, a, a small group really liked it, and mainly young men. Um, and because it had a strong appeal to a small group, they launched it, and it went on to be a big success, became a cult show. 
Yeah. Um, so sometimes you you have to be deliberately offensive uh, almost in order to get attention because the most important thing in business nowadays is to be different. Just being a little bit better isn't sufficient uh, because there's lots of better hotels, there's lots of better uh, restaurants, there's lots of but but the ones that are really different are the ones that that you remember and and which stand out from the crowd. Yeah, that's so true, and I I would put a little ping in to say that I think we saw that in our recent presidential election here in the United States of, you know, just being like everybody else or just being a little bit better, a little bit on the same line didn't work over here this time around. So that's, well, a- <laughs> that's it's a fascinating example. Yeah. That all of the other can- um, Republican candidates looked like a politician. Yeah. And yeah. Donald Trump didn't. Yeah. And he deliberately spoke differently and positioned himself differently. And therefore he appealed more. I mean, we could have a big discussion about um, other things about him. Yeah, we, we he, could. <laughs> we, he did position himself quite differently from politicians, and people were fed up with politicians. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great example of, you know, he went out and per- was purposely alienating and offensive, um, offending, and it worked. So it's, yes. it's, you know, <laughs> just from a purely objective perspective, it worked. Um, tell us, well, actually, let me, go, let me flip over. Given what we were just kind of talking about, what role does innovation have in today's environment? Why is it so important? You know, I don't know if it's now more than ever, but it definitely matters. Yes. So, you know, um, just going back to Donald Trump, he, he talks about protecting American jobs by by protectionism and by bringing work back from overseas for American workers in American factories. But, you know, that's that's not the answer because the big threat to American workers isn't the Chinese. Now it's, it's robots. Yeah, it's technology. And, um, yes. Uh, and uh, we're going to see robotic workers in one form or another take a lot of jobs. And that's why in terms of individuals, you know, if you want a successful career, you've got to be able to reskill, to be an innovator, to be a thinker, to create new opportunities. Because the one thing robots can't do is they can't ask questions. They can't uh, imagine new possibilities. They can carry out a predefined function really, really well. But it's the use of our imagination and our creativity which makes humans different and better. And we all need to acquire skills in those areas and deploy those skills and more than ever. And uh, for America to succeed or Britain to succeed or any developed uh, nation with an expensive, costly tax base to succeed, you've got to be doing creative new things. Uh, not just more of the old uh, manufacturing jobs. You know, I think you just really very well articulated what I hear from a lot of our clients and and leaders in organizations, uh, which is I need my people to be innovative. Like people kind of, I think, intuitively understand that, but the way you, I never really thought about it that way of, you know, it's about that asking those questions and imagining those new possibilities. And if you can bring that to your work, you have a much higher chance of having a successful career. Yes. And the company benefits. So everybody benefits. T- yes. Tell us about your new book, Think Like an Innovator. So I tell a lot of stories about innovators and, and uh, from all walks of life and, and warfare and sport and business. Um, and I put them in my talks. And I decided to put together some of the best examples into a book um, of, of great innovators and how they approach problems differently. What was their thinking pattern? What insights can we get uh, from those innovators, uh, which we can then apply in our own lives and, and in our own workplaces. And I put together 76 of those, and they're in this book. It's a very easy to read book. It's called Think Like an Innovator. And they range from Madonna to Gustav Eiffel, from uh, Beethoven to uh, uh, Bill Gates, all, those, every, all, all sorts of different people. And um, uh, for each one, I've tried to say what the challenge was, what great innovation they came up with, and then what lessons we can apply from that. So will you share one of the stories from the book, like one that would surprise us? I think you kind of brushed quickly past Madonna and some of those other, you know, there are some great, Lady Gaga, Beyonce. There's some, I think, great innovators in the music and the artistic world. Will you share just a little bit from one of the stories from the book? Yeah, well, Madonna is a good example in that she has consistently reinvented herself. So she started off in, uh, you know, as, as a grunge girl with with uh, strange fashions. And then she became the the material girl. She became a Marilyn Monroe figure. She was a mother figure. She's a an act. She was a virgin at one stage. She's <laughs> she's been an iconoclast at, at, at all levels. Yeah. Um, but she's constantly reinvented herself. And many many musicians, they find one groove. And they've got a big fan base and and the fans like that kind of music and they keep doing the same thing over and over again. And their 10th album is like their first album. But she's not like that. She's been prepared to take a chance and do something different, even if it alienated some of her earlier fans. 
Yeah. She was prepared to do that, to move on and to, to challenge herself and to try new things. And she went into acting with with, uh, with mixed success. She was, uh, but then she was in Evita. She was very good at that. So she's she's done a whole range of different things, and and she's constantly challenging herself to find a new way forward. And we've got to do the same. We can't stand still and rest on our laurels. We've got to find something new, a different challenge, learn a new skill, do something different. You know what? I, she is an interesting one, and one of the things I really appreciate about her is that she seems to always. Take, you know, she's on the cutting edge of the trends. It's like she really takes the time to say what's happening in the industry, in the music industry with people's you know, um, d- needs and desires, and then takes, it, takes what's happening, those kind of bubbling up trends, and takes them to the next level and incorporates them in a way that's t- surprising and delightful. Yes. So how did you pick who goes in your book? I'm curious I about chose your criteria them. are. Yeah, not because they're the greatest innovators or they did the most brilliant things, but because they had a lesson that we could apply, that we could take across. Um, so some of the great geniuses, it's hard to learn from, uh, but but some of the more routine guys, we can learn from. So it's, it's a real mix. Were there any um, that surprised you that you you kind of didn't think about going in, but as you started you know, doing your research and being curious, that popped out for you? Well, you know, I, um, so... It, The French Revolution was in 1789, and uh, 100 years later, in 1889, the the, the governors of Paris wanted to create some kind of uh, of, uh, memorial, some kind of um, monument to recognize the centenary of the French Revolution, and they asked a lot of people to make suggestions. And a a civil engineer called Gustave Eiffel suggested that they erect the largest iron building that had ever been conceived, much taller than anything else that had ever been built anywhere in the world. Um, and it was going to be a, a huge tower that would uh, tower over Paris. Um, and uh, a lot of people thought this was a terrible idea. There were, and, and when he looked as though he might win, there was a huge committee of the the most uh, eminent French thinkers and intellectuals who opposed it, who said it was a really ugly idea. It would dominate the French skyline. It would tower over Notre Dame. It would be a horrible, horrible thing. And he uh, tackled this problem in two ways. First of all, he said... Uh, we should be proud of what the French can do, and we should be prepared to do something which will amaze the world. But secondly, he said, it's only a temporary structure. We'll just have it up for this period of the exhibition uh, for 18 months or two years. Then we can take it down, and we'll go back to the Paris skyline before. Um, and by using that argument, he was able to get approval to build the Eiffel Tower, yeah. which has remained there to this day and is the most paid monument Uh, most visited paid monument in the world. It's become a symbol for Paris. And the lesson for us is if you've got a difficult idea, which a lot of people in your business oppose, say, let's do it as a pilot. Let's do it as an experiment. Let's do it in a small, let's see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we can always go back to the old way of working. And very often you'll get approval for that rather than saying, this is a new big way to do things and we're going to replace everything we've done before because the, 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 the forces of conservatism will oppose that very strongly. Yeah, it's very scary, I think, too. To, there's a difference between changing and being changed. Yes. So I want to kind of wrap up the innovation part with the question of how do I, if I'm kind of, I'm delving into lateral thinking, I'm adding my emotion, how do I know if I'm, if I'm being innovative and on the right path? And I know that sounds like a, a silly question for those of us in the business, but I hear that often from people of, I don't know if I'm innovative. Well, the, the, the acid test is what have you done in the last month that's new and different? Um, and, and at a personal level, we should be trying new things. Uh, all the time that, that stretch us. Uh, so if you always go to the bridge club, go to the salsa club, uh, you know, and if you always read, if you always watch CNN, watch Al Jazeera and, uh, uh, and deliberately challenge yourself. But And in your business, the question is, what have you done which has surprised your customers in the last year? What have you done? What have you brought to the market that's new and different? And people say, wow, that was good. I wish we'd thought of that. Um, that's really the acid test of, of to what extent are you implementing innovation rather than just thinking of new things? Because anyone can lie in bed in the morning and think of something new, right. uh, but it's actually doing it that counts. Well, that's your, as going back to the beginning of our conversation, the difference between creativity and innovation. So where can people connect with you and buy your book? Well, the, my books are all available on Amazon, amazon.com, amazon.co.uk, amazon.de, all of the Amazons. Uh, so if you search for Paul Sloan, Sloan with an E, uh, you can find me on uh, destinationinnovation.com. That's my website. 
I'm on Twitter at Paul Sloan, uh, all one word, and I run a website called the Lateral Puzzles Forum, which is www.lateralpuzzles.com, where you can do lateral puzzles. Oh, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm going to be there later it today. Is. And we will put all of this in the show notes too, so that people can click directly through. Paul, this has been fabulous, really just so insightful in, in how we think and why, and, and not just not just why, but how we how we need to think differently and be innovative. The last question for you is, what's one thing people would be st- surprised to know about you? A you know, personal hobby, experience, passion? Well, I'm a very keen chess player, and I love playing chess. And um, uh, I, I spend hours on the internet playing chess and then uh, analyzing my games. So that's uh, that's both a, a hobby and a weakness, I think. So while I'm on Facebook for hours, you're playing chess for hours. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Oh my God. I have two sons that both are on the chess team at school. So I'm learning through them. (laughs) Good. Yeah. It's a great game. Well, it's a great game to learn about about thinking ahead and strategy. And I hadn't really realized that until I started playing. Paul, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on. So insightful. Thank you very much, Tamara. Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on GoToLaunchStreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to LaunchStreet.com.